it's good to see you back out. Thank you for coming back tonight to the Come and Go With Me revival. And it's been a beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Let's stand and let's sing, I'll Fly Away. Will some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home. Jeff Barr, would you open us in a word of prayer, brother? Amen. You may be seated. Well, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Is a friend he watches both day and night. Cause I go to him in prayer, and he knows my every care. And just a little talk with my Jesus makes it alright. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let Yeah. 
amen, it is good. It's just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Where y'all at? Every time. Every time. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody ought to have been saying amen right there. Oh, it is good to see everybody back out tonight, and uh, we're just thrilled to, to be back tonight. And uh, it's good to see the, uh, the, the youth people out, That's right. see, the youth people, That's right. yeah, uh, to come back. Thank you all for coming back out, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, the, the neat thing about this setting is, is... Uh, uh, this morning we got up and we, we went out and we actually sat over by the pond and, uh, and it was just really neat to, uh, to be sitting right here and hearing everything that's going on in the morning. And, uh, but it's, it's wonderful to hear what God can do. And I want to tell you tonight, he's got something for you tonight. But you, you've got to come and get it from him. See, as Jeff shared with you yesterday, he's not a rude guest. He's knocking, and he'll open up, and he'll come in if you'll invite him. So he's got something for each one of you tonight. And so I pray as we continue through the, the worship time, if you know the song you sing with us, if you need to come and pray, hey, these altars are open. You come any point in time during this service. doesn't matter if... The preaching's going on. The singing's going on. If the Lord puts it on your heart to come and pray for somebody or come and pray and leave a burden up here, you just be obedient. And I want to tell you, he'll bless you for that. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Seal my trophies out. Oh 
coach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away and wear his glory As I look back at the back of the church, uh, well, church, sanctuary, grandpa's place, there's a cross that's back there. And I think about that as we were singing that song, just what it means, the cross. I guess it was last year in August, we were doing a revival over in El Dorado, and and I was preaching I did on the piece that the prisoners are the people who And just that one piece that they would strap to their arms and they would have to walk with that on their back. Strapped to their hands, making their way up to Golgotha. That piece weighed anywhere from a 75 pounds to 125 pounds. Just that one piece. And to think of what our Lord had already endured, the scourgings, the beatings that he had had, the crown of thorns that was woven and drove down on his head, just how sore his body was. See, you've got to remember, he was 100% man and 100% God. So... He feels everything. That he when we get stung by a wasp or we cut our hand, that pain that is felt, he felt that. So every time now when we sing that song, I think about what my Lord endured for me. What he did for me as he walked, just that, just that one portion, not to include everything that had happened previous. But everything that happened as he made his way up to Calvary. So the next time when you hear the song, The Old Rugged Cross, I pray that that picture will be in your mind. Carrying that up there for you. Carrying it up there for me. That's the love that our Lord has for us. To the old rugged I will ever be true It's shame and reproach Gladly bear Then he'll call me someday to my home far away 
the Lord some praise. And I'm saved by grace Oh, and I've been saved by grace And my name is in the book of life And my sins are washed away And I'm saved by grace Oh, and I've been saved by grace It's not what I deserve But I'm saved by grace I'm saved by grace, oh, and I've been saved by grace. My name is in the book of life, and my sins are washed away. And I am saved by grace. It's not what I deserve, but I'm saved by grace. And it's what I deserve, but I'm saved by Amen. Aren't you glad you're saved by grace? Amen. 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 I tell you what, I, I have just done decided we're going to have to get one of them articulating buses that has some extra passenger seats on it so we can carry the youth crew with us. Amen. Yeah, that way they can go with us because 
We've been in a lot of places. We need some light there. Amen. I'm telling you, we've been in some of them. I know where the first church is going to rise because the dead in Christ will rise first. I've been to some of those churches. It's got to be the first one that's going to go in the rapture. So uh, y'all think about that. Y'all get that after a while, okay? And uh, But, you know, I, I wanted to take a moment. Uh, uh, the Lord just really put on my heart as we were singing that. Y'all just get your drink of water and hold on there just a second. Um, Jeff, he's going, oxygen would be good. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but we were at an a Angola prison down in Angola, Louisiana. Uh, I guess it was about um, really almost two weeks ago. This Friday would be two weeks ago. We were down in Angola. Uh, that's the second year that we've gone down there. Uh, we go down there for a two-day revival uh, with the Louisiana Baptist Convention. And um, we were in there, and I want to tell you that is... It's a phenomenal place. You think, phenomenal? Yeah, it's 18,000 acres and there's 6,200 inmates in there right now. But the neat thing about it, 40 to 42% of the population of Angola is sold out, born again, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. 42%. In today's church, the average church roll membership, only 20 to 25% is saved. So there's more saved in prison than there is in church right now. That's a lot to think about. We go into a lot of prisons all, all over Arkansas and down in Louisiana. Uh, coming up in May, we're going back to Angola for three days. Uh, we'll be in there three days. Uh, we're going down there for the returning hearts that they do. Uh, the Awana program uh, sponsors returning hearts, but the chaplain down there, he invited us to come back early, and so we're going to get to do several services in some of the different camps. And, uh, and see, they don't house all the prisoners at the same facility on that 18,000 acres. There's different camps. One of the camps has uh, uh, over, I think it's 5,000 in it, and then the rest is divided out through the others. Now, Angola used to be known as one of the bloodiest prisons in the United States. And then Jesus got a hold of it. I want to tell you, when Jesus gets a hold of you and me, our lives, our home, our business, whatever it is, a change happens. They have a seminary on site there at Angola. Yes, they are training preachers and missionaries. They've had over 300 graduates that have graduated seminary in the last 10 years. So I'm telling you, God is doing a mighty work. So much so that the warden, Warden Kane, super Christian man, he has impacted the prison systems all over the United States because of what Jesus Christ has done in the prison that he is the warden in. I want to tell you, Jesus is phenomenal. He is so great. And getting to go back down there and to spend time, you, you just, you really don't even, the first time you go in there, it's really overwhelming. As we go in and clear the main gate, and they park us right beside death row. Uh, that's where they have a plug for our bus and we back up there and they have the training center there for the, all of the guards. But I wanted to tell you it's where the next time a lot of people call it jailhouse religion. I don't care what you call it. People get saved. They can call it going to the yard and getting saved. But when you go into prisons, most of those people there, God's got their attention some way or the other. And we've seen those guys, I want to tell you, they study the Bible. And it's a city within itself. It's a self-supporting prison. They don't receive hardly any funds from the state. They raise cattle. They raise horses and sell horses to other law enforcement facilities. They raise guard dogs, train them, sell them off. They have untold acres of farmland that they... And these prisoners work from about 4 o'clock in the morning till about 4 in the afternoon. And then they start their classes. I've never seen anything like it. 
Somebody asked me last year, said, well, are you uh, a worker or do you promote Angola? I said, no, I promote Jesus and what Jesus can do in somebody's life. And I've seen it there. I've seen it over and over. And as we go into the prisons, it's one of the places that God has called us to go into. We travel there and there's no funding to go into prisons. We don't get paid when we go into prisons. The payment we get is seeing one night we saw 34 saved. The next night we saw 48 saved. We saw 15 this last time down in Angola saved, which was a very low, low number. No, normally it's over 100 down there. We've been up into North Arkansas to several prisons up there, and it's nothing to see 20 to 30 men except Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Hey, they've got a follow-up program. When these men accept the Lord, they put their uh, Department of Corrections number down on a little commitment card, and within 24 hours, some of the chaplain staff follows up with them. 24 hours. We don't do that in church. We don't. They are serious about presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't know why the Lord wanted me to share that with you at this very moment in time, but I can tell you this much. Folks are getting saved in prisons and lives are getting changed. And that may be where the next great revival breaks out. It's right in, in the prison system. See, Angola was the first to have a seminary. Now there's one in Mississippi. They're in the process. Of, they've got one in Texas. They're in the process of putting one in Florida. See, so there's some things that are happening. We as a church need to pray that God will continue to open these avenues and watch as men. You can be sitting in those services and the Saturday morning service that we, we were in, the evangelist that was preaching that day, he asked one of the inmates about a certain psalm, a, a passage. Six of the men started quoting it, 27 verses, word for word. Got in unison, blowed my mind, 27 verses. Oh, and you could ask a mother scripture, and they'll stand up and quote it to you. I'm thankful that God gives us glimpses of his power and his glory. Hey, last night we got a good picture of it here. We got a good picture of his saving power, what can happen. If we'll just be faithful and we'll just submit to what God wants us to do. Hey, he used a donkey, he'll use anybody. He used a donkey to talk. That's in the Old Testament. Y'all can go. It, it's there. But God wants to use you. He wants to use all of us if we'll just submit to him. Hey, it may not be to get on a bus and go. It may be right here. Going door to door, just knocking, saying, hey, I missed you Sunday. Everything okay? Whatever it is. Just be obedient and let God use you. I pray that that'll sink in and the testimony of Angola that the next time somebody talks about going to a prison, that that'll pop back up into your mind and you'll say, well, there's some stuff going on. It's not all what they say. See, they did a, I guess it was well, last year, I understand they did a, uh, a show about Angola on the one of the, the Discovery or something and they've, they pictured it as being one of the bloodiest places to go into last year they did a passion play down there the 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 inmates played the parts they've got a arena down there that will hold 15,000 people and at this passion play they had over 1200 people come to know the Lord that the inmates put on it's it's amazing. All we have to do is be submissive. He wants to use every one of you guys. I can tell you that. God does. He wants you to reach people that I can't reach them, but you can. He wants you to go and tell your friends, hey, a lot of you brought friends back tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and that is so cool because of the fact, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. 
There's more kids here than there is adults. Praise God. Amen. And I'm thankful to those that came straight from the ball game. Thank y'all. That means a lot. That means a lot. If you guys would just teach us adults, I think we'll be all right. Well, he told me to introduce my song, and I've never done that, so. Um, <laughs> uh, last year, we were coming back from West Virginia, and I was sitting in the back, and I was just playing the guitar, and I was just start playing a rhythm, and I was like, Lord, I'm like, that can belong to him. And me and Ashley were sitting back there, and she said, well, let me get a sheet of paper and a pen. And I was like, okay. I didn't even tell her nothing. But, uh, and all of a sudden... I started writing these words, and I would go up to Dad, and he really was driving, so he really wasn't paying attention. But I would sing it to him anyways, like he was paying attention. And I'll, be, I'll be right back. So i will go back to the back and write some more. And so in a few minutes, probably 20 minutes or so, I had the song wrote. So it's called His Name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, the one who died, he saved my life, and he gave me signs, and he's come back one day. Trumpet will oh, 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 oh. this man who died will save your life and he will call you home. You may have problems that you don't know. Understand, but just call on the master, and he'll come the storm with his hand. Just fall on your face and cry out, sin. he'll see. This man who died will save your life and be right there for you. His name is Jesus, the one who died. He saved. Him 
Jeff, they come down. Um, we're going to take up an offering. And like David told you last night, um, this is strictly to further the ministry. Um, we, uh, it, it takes quite a bit of money to get that thing on wheels to, to go round and round and round and round and round. And so this is simply a love offering, and it's to further the ministry of the Crusaders. Just give what your heart would allow you to give. It's, 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 uh, it's an honor to be here. But there's so much more that we're looking forward to going out and serving more. And every little bit helps. Every little bit helps to go and further the ministry. And it means more to me than anything that I have three youth standing in front of me right now. That is cool. That is awesome. And so, Brother Jeff, will you do me a favor and will you bless the offering for me, bud?
surely hears all the folks who are praying fervently down on their knees so unaware of my deep desperation each interceding for me when I see someone with a hand gently risen, asking the righteous to pray. I think of that time when I burden was mine, and I know there's still power in His name. And I was somebody's unspoken reason. For their tears and pain, and saints join together to lift me in prayer without even knowing my name. Laid on the altar and given to God, trusting the Father. Stand here redeemed and an answer from heaven to someone's unspoken request. Yes, and I was somebody's, I was somebody's, somebody's unspoken request. Make your way down here, buddy. Uh, Stephen, he sits back there at the back most of the time and hides behind those computers and those screens. And and uh, I wanted him to come up and. Stephen's been with us now. Um, let's see, this September will be two years, won't it? And um, God has just been doing a neat thing. Uh, let me just tell a little of this, and then, and, and then I'm going to give it to you to share. Before Stephen came into the ministry of the Crusaders, we didn't need a sound guy. Wasn't hunting one. We kept everything right up here. But God had a bigger vision. One of the visions is, is those cameras that are hung up there in the air. Uh, when we get back home, he will upload all these videos from each one of the nights. And by the way, if you'd like a copy of tonight's service, you can hang around for about 20 minutes afterwards, see Stephen, and he can give you a DVD, and you can carry it home with you tonight. Uh, we are just asked for a donation on that. We suggest $20, because uh, that's no normally what you pay for a DVD these days. But uh, you see Stephen afterwards, and he'll take care of that. But old Dave couldn't run all that stuff back there. There's no way. And so God had a big picture in mind. And a big picture of there was so much more that what he was planning to do than I could see. And uh, so I'll, you take it from there and you take your time. <laughs> um, well, I walked down the aisle when I was nine years old and, and thought I got saved. Everything, you know, at nine years old, there's not a lot in your life that really can change as far as, you know, as big changes that can happen is in old, when you're older in life that you can have major changes after you get saved. When you're nine years old, a lot didn't happen. And so I went through the years and started running sound in church when I was 10 years old and have done that for 
the past 10 years now. And But on February the 22nd of this year, uh, it became real to me that I, I wasn't saved. Um, I'd sit through who knows how many church services, and it bothered me a little bit. And I always chalked it up to say that it was just like Ashley says in her testimony, the devil was telling me I wasn't saved, that I was saved and everything was fine and everything was good, and that... Uh, and I was doing the right thing and everything else. And even the whole time that I've been in church since I was nine years old and, and got saved, thought I got saved, let me rephrase that, and uh, I thought I felt God lead me. And I, I think in a way he kind of did. He kept me away from everything that I, that I shouldn't have been around. I stayed in church and I was just, I guess when I look back on it, I was just, it's like being this close to winning a race. I was this close to God, yet so far away, that I couldn't, I, I got to where I couldn't get anything, and God had to, to make it real to me, so it got to when I was praying, which my prayers really never got through anyway, because the only prayer you hear for you're saved is the prayer of salvation, asking him to save you, but it got to where my prayers didn't seem like they went anywhere, they just came back down and fell on me, which, you know, they were the whole time when you think about it, because God doesn't hear anything until you're saved. Well, you know, he had to make it real to me, and I just, I got to where I was disgruntled during Bible study, because I couldn't get nothing out of it, and just upset and everything, and just uh, for a while, just went through a real tough time that I don't know if anybody even, I don't know, I'm sure Miss Penny saw it, because she told me, because the day that she, uh, Jonathan got saved, she said, you need to come in here right now, or whatever, and Jonathan knelt and prayed and everything, well then when we got done, I was sitting there in the chair across from her, and she said, so do you have any questions about your salvation? And I'm just kind of looking at her, and I'm like, uh, long silence. Brother David said, well I can answer that for you then, then you're not saved. And so, I really struggled though, because like I said, got saved, walked down the aisle when I was nine years old, thought I got saved, been in church this whole time. I was worried about what people were going to think back at my old church and what my grandparents were going to think majorly because you were supposed to get saved when you were nine years old and that's the way you know that, that I thought they were going to look at it and that everybody at, at my church was going to look at it. That You said you were saved when you were nine, nine years old. And, but as Jonathan said, I got head saved. I didn't get heart saved. And I just thank God that he revealed that to me. But I guess what I want to get across to you tonight, if you're not saved and you're worried about what people's going to think, it doesn't matter what people are going to think. It just matters what God thinks. And, and the people you hang out with at school... And anywhere else in your life, if you are saved, if you hang out with the wrong crowd, then you're influencing people that are in that are in other crowds that are looking at people, looking at us that are supposed to be Christians. Well, they're hanging out with this group of people. They're doing these things, and they go to church. You shouldn't be hanging out with the with the other crowd that's not church people, that's not that's not born again, because you're never. I'm not going to say you're not going to lead them to Christ, but being best friends with them, they're more likely to pull you down to their level than to you to pull them up to your level. And your friends at school... brain's talking to me. <laughs> I don't know, right now, I just feel there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus. I don't know where this just came from, it just fell on me. And I just feel like there's somebody sitting in, the, in these seats tonight that doesn't know the Lord as their personal Savior. I don't know who it is, but you you need to get it right before you leave here tonight because we're not promised another day. We're not promised even another second on this earth. 
And if you were to die and go into eternity without Jesus, then you're going to spend a lifetime, an eternity, in a devil's hell. And I don't want my worst enemy to go to hell. I tell you. But there's somebody here right now that's, that's not saved, and they're, they're worried about what people are going to think. And it doesn't matter what people are going to think. We have too short a time until Jesus comes back to worry about what other people think. And I just want, as I give this mic back to Brother David and he starts preaching, I just want you to reflect in your heart and just ask yourself and pray to God and ask him if you're having doubts. Ask him if you're, if you're saved. And if you can't for 100% answer that question, then come to this altar. It doesn't matter any time while he's preaching or I'm talking right now. Just come to this altar and somebody will meet you and you can get it right. Thank you. Well, I tell you, Stephen is, um, is way out of his comfort zone right there. And, uh, but I'm thankful that he was obedient because of, of just what he said. See, things happen when we get obedient with God. Things begin to change. Things begin to take place. God begins to do a work in our life. I see now I was all prepared to, to preach to you out of the book of Ezekiel tonight, but uh, since Stephen came up here and from the time I walked over there to here, it's all changed. It's all changed because he spoke a word and he didn't even know it that he spoke a word. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke chapter 19 and we're going to start there. Oh, uh, we all know the story of Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in the, for the, and as the, he, and he said, that's exactly what the little song says. If you've found the book of Luke, Chapter 19, if you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and we're going to start at verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and beheld there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see whom Jesus was, because, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short in statue. So he ran ahead and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And he said, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down. For today I must stay at your house. And so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is gone to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. Aren't you glad Jesus loves sinners? Then Zacchaeus said, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I'll give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. Verse 9, And Jesus said, to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony. We thank you that the words that you place on our hearts, and Lord, when we get obedient, we do what you want us to do. Our Father, I pray that you be with us tonight I pray you'd be with me as I, I stand and that Lord that it wouldn't be my words but it would be your words and Father you speak through me you have your way in this service Father I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and Lord you said if I be lifted up I'll draw all men unto me so Father I pray that you will be exalted and raised up to high and mighty places and draw us all unto you now Father be with uh, the ones here tonight that 
don't know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that they'll make haste like Zacchaeus and come down, Lord, and meet you at the foot of the cross. Lord, open our hearts up to hear what you would have to say. It's about you. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. We find that all we all have been raised to Bible school to know the story of Zacchaeus. But I find that there's some interesting things about Zacchaeus. We find that Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was going to be coming by. So he wanted to see who he was. And that's the number one thing that I want us to take a look at first of all. When Jesus comes by, you better want to see who he is. Because he may not pass by that area again. See, the Bible says that his spirit does not always dwell with man. So opportunity to get saved may not pass by you again if you miss it. Zacchaeus, he wanted to see what was going on. He wanted to see who this Jesus was because there had been a lot of talk. A lot of things had gone on. They had talked about, uh, is this the Messiah? Could this be the Messiah? There had been a lot of miracles. There had been... Folks being healed, there'd been folks uh, being delivered, uh, just they'd seen great things. Great multitudes were following. And so as the crowd made their way, Zacchaeus being a small man, the Bible says he was short in statue. So he wanted to see Jesus. My friend, we ought to want to see Jesus. We ought to do what it takes to want to see Jesus. Zacchaeus decided uh, to go to a sycamore tree. How many of you know what a sycamore tree is? That's them trees that's got that flaky bark on them, isn't it? And they're easy to climb. I mean, it's just like there's a ladder in them. I can remember when I was a little boy. That was just yesterday, okay? And uh, I would go and climb a sycamore tree because there used to be one at my grandmother's house. And so it was the, you know, it was the place to be, especially you could get way up to the top. Zacchaeus, he wasn't worried about how high he could get. He just wanted to get over the crowd so he could see who this Jesus was that was passing by. It's always neat to watch the most unexpected person who Jesus makes contact with. See, Jesus knew that there was going to be an encounter with Zacchaeus that day. Just like he knows that there's an encounter happening here tonight. See, it's not by chance that you're here tonight. It's divine appointments. See, that's all we have in life is divine appointments. We can choose not to come. Yes, you could have chosen to go on and done something, something else. But God already knew that you were going to be here to hear. See, he already knew that he was going to change what I had planned. My job was to be obedient. Your job is to be obedient. Zacchaeus wanted to find out who Jesus was. And so he made haste and he went, ran ahead of the crowd, the Bible says. I think we need to look at that. Sometimes we need to run a little bit ahead of the crowd instead of blending in with the crowd. I think y'all could understand a little of this because it's easy if you blend in with the crowd, the next thing you know you've done got into trouble and you wasn't even involved in it. You just happen to be blended in with the crowd. Uh, us adults, we ought to understand that real good. It's real easy to go over to the casinos in Shreveport and eat at those nice restaurants that they have and blend in with the crowd even though we're not going to the casino. Where's your witness? Where's your testimony? Stay out of those places. You don't belong there. We're to be a peculiar people. We're to be set apart. Oh, but the food's cheap. Yeah, you want to know why? They want you in there. Satan wants you in there to ruin your testimony. Oh, but I'm not going in. It's no different. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Don't blend in with the crowd. Run ahead of the crowd. Hey, if you run to the place where Jesus is, guess what? Somebody might follow you. So Zacchaeus, he ran ahead of the crowd to get to the place where he could climb up into the tree. And so as he made his perch up there, as the crowd began to make their way coming down, what do you think was going on in his little mind? I think his heart had to be racing because he was wanting to see who Jesus was. It's kind of like when you get under conviction and you know that the Lord is dealing with you, your heart will go to racing and get just like it's going to beat out of your chest and you're wondering, I don't understand, I need to do something. Zacchaeus knew he needed to do something. He ran ahead of the crowd, he climbed up in the tree, Jesus began to get close and all of a sudden he's right there and he stops and he turns to him. See, that's pretty cool when Jesus stops and speaks to you personally. And he looked at him and he said, Zacchaeus, 
Reckon how he knew his name. See, that's God. He knows us. And he called him by name. Told him to make haste and come down. Zacchaeus did. He said, for I'm going to your house today. That picture of the house is two different things. The people that saw Zacchaeus and Jesus leave with him knew he was going to abide at his home. But my friend, I think we can look at this and say, when Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus and told him, said, make haste for I'm going to your house today, I'm talking about a heaven, a temple that's inside of us. He wanted to abide inside of Zacchaeus. He was knocking. And Zacchaeus needed to open the door to allow him to come in. See, when they got to his home, Zacchaeus had to open the door for Jesus to come in. That's what you have to do to invite Jesus into your heart is open the door. Zacchaeus made haste. He didn't, he didn't form a question there and say, uh, let me call ahead and see if it's okay. I need to check and see if my calendar is open. No, he made haste. Now you've got to back up and you've got to remember, Zacchaeus, the Bible says, was a rich man. He was wealthy. He had everything that money could buy, I'm sure. But he didn't have Jesus. See, we can tie up everything we have in material things. See, there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff as long as it doesn't become your God. As long as it's not what you worship, there's nothing wrong with a nice vehicle. There's nothing wrong with a nice home. But it, when it becomes your God and starts taking you away, then you start serving it more than you're serving God. We find that Zacchaeus was a rich man, so he had it all, except he didn't know Jesus. And he wanted to meet Jesus. See, that's one of the places we have to come to in our lives, is we have to understand that we get to a point and we say, I need Jesus. I want to meet him personally. Well, Zacchaeus he made haste and he came down immediately and they went to Zacchaeus' house. And we find that the Bible says that all of a sudden there was a change that began to happen with Zacchaeus because he begins to tell him, Lord, I'll give half to the poor. And if I've wronged anybody, I'll just keep it. Is that what he said? Well, I'll give them back a portion of it. Is that what he said? I'll give them back some of it. I'll restore to them four times the amount that I took from them. When Jesus comes into your life, you can't help but change the way you act. You just can't. You want to serve him. You want to go after him. When he gets real inside your heart, you're going to do all you can for him. You'll stop lying. You'll stop cheating. You'll stop going to them websites that you don't need to go to. You'll stop watching that HBO, that Cinemax, and that Showtime, that Spike. You get off all that junk because your desires begin to change. Your want-tos begin to change. Your needs will begin to change. So I'm telling you, when Jesus steps in... When Jesus stepped into Zacchaeus' house, change began to happen. My friend, when Jesus steps into your house, change will begin to happen. If there's no change in your house, you don't have an address change. If things look the same as what they always had, just as Stephen stood up here a while ago and shared his testimony, there was no change 
and the way that young, young man walked. Hey, I was there in them Bible studies. He'd be sitting there, and he'd get mad. We'd start talking about a scripture, and we'd be trying to talk, what do you think about it? He'd get plumb mad. He didn't have anything to say. My friend, when you don't know Jesus, you ain't got anything to say except, Lord, save me, I need you. When Jesus steps into your life, things change. Your want to's change. Oh, I don't mean that you're going to be a person that's immediately you're going to put a coat and tie on and you're going to tote a, a 40-pound Schofield Bible around with you every day. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking heart changes happen. Your want to's, your desires change in your life. You begin to want more of Jesus and less of the world. Zacchaeus was very plain about what happened to him. I'll give half of what I've got to the poor, and I, if I've wronged anybody, I'll restore them fourfold. Jesus is saying, make haste. For today, I want to come to your house. So many times, at that point in time, I used to hear a lot of the preachers say, if Jesus was to come by, is there things in your house you'd have to put away that you'd be ashamed of? And I can always remember growing up, we used to have this big family Bible stayed in the, the living room. Nobody never read it. It was just one of them old big family Bibles that stayed on the coffee table. And I, and I got to thinking, the, the first thing I thought of as a young boy when I heard that was like, well, he'd like that. He'd like that. Well, it's a big Bible, you know. Hey, you know what he's concerned about? This house. Because when you get this house cleaned up, the physical house will start cleaning up. That's what happened. Zacchaeus did some house cleaning because he accepted Jesus as his Savior, recognized who he was, invited him into his house. Things begin to change. Has things ever changed in your house or does it look the same as it did? We've been doing some, uh, with our da daughter and son-in-law, we, we've been going to some houses in Russellville because they're trying to buy a house up there. And so we'd go in to these houses and you'd walk in and immediately you'd look at the carpet and you'd go, ooh. And they had some of that ugly greenish paint that they painted in the 70s. And that carpet that was green. And, you know, that sculptured carpet and all this kind of stuff. And they call it. And so immediately you could tell that there was no change in that house. And then you'd go out of a house and then you'd go into, it's still on the outside was an older house than the one you just left. But you walked in and you went, wow, there's been a change right here. They've done a lot. Do folks say that about you? See, because in your life, once you get saved, it's a constant change every day. It should be growing in the Lord every day. See, you don't get to a point and stop because, look, we're never going to arrive until we reach heaven. Never. So each day should be a closer and closer and a change and a change and a change in our lives from what it used to be. So we leave that old green, yucky stuff behind us and it begins to be a new, vibrant color. That's beautiful in the Lord's eyes. See, that happen with Zacchaeus. There was a change in Zacchaeus. The most obvious change was that he met Jesus personally. And when you met Jesus personally, it should change your life. Won't nobody have to tell you. We, we went back uh, this last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was over in El Dorado and did a revival uh, before we came over here. The pastor come up to me was well, a friend of ours that hadn't seen us since John Jonathan had gotten saved back in February. And he said, wow, 
said Jonathan was an awesome singer to begin with. I can say that I'm dad, and I know singing, and so he's he, he's very gifted. God's gave, gave him a gift, but it's like day and night from February the twenty second. See, before it was just singing. It was good, but it was just singing. Now when he sings, he sings from the heart. Because Jesus came by. And he accepted him when he came by. My friend, is there a change in your house? Can you, can you look and see and know that there's a change? See, there's been a change in Stephen too. See, I, I've watched Stephen as well because, uh, well, right now, I'll just tell you, uh, Penny and I and Jonathan, we have house guests. Stephen, Brother Jeff, Miss Noel, Isaac, and Isaiah. And when we're home, Ashley stays there. She, she has a room there instead of staying at the dorm because she doesn't li like to stay at the dorm at college. And guess what? We study the Bible at least twice a day. I'm not talking about five minutes, usually an hour and a half each time we sit down because we love to learn about the Lord. Because when Jesus passed by, he made a change in our life. And our house looks a little different from what it used to. Our personal houses look different because I was there the night that Ashley got saved as she knelt there at our home in the living room in front of the couch and asked the Lord to come in and save her. I was there when Jonathan knelt on the other couch, on the other side of the same room, and asked the Lord to save him. I was there when Stephen got on the other couch. We have assigned seating at our house. <laughs> and I watched as he prayed and accepted the Lord. See, there's a change in their walk. Before, Ashley would have never got up here and shared her testimony yesterday. She didn't have anything to share about because she didn't have Jesus in her heart. I want to tell you, why don't you come down out of that sycamore tree, make haste and run to Jesus. He's waiting. He's waiting. Would you bow your heads? There's going to be some folks here at the front to pray with you. You need to come. The altar's open. You need to come and pray. But most of all, do you know Jesus? Have you ever invited him into your heart? See, Zacchaeus had to invite him to come in. You've got to invite him to come into your heart. Have you ever personally asked Jesus to save you and to forgive you of your sins? and to be your personal Savior. If you have, there ought to be a change in your house. If there's no change in your house, the chances are there's no change in your heart. So you're saying, Brother David, you mean if I can still go out and drink and party and do all those things that I used to do that I'm not saved? chances are pretty likely because when you get Jesus in your heart your want to's and your desires begin to change because you're going to think about that old rugged cross that he was nailed to that he suffered and died for you and when you pick up that can or you begin to smoke that that you don't need to or you begin to watch that old video that you don't need to any of those things see sin is sin it doesn't matter we want to categorize it but sin is sin but when you start easing into that sin it's going to be that voice that's going to say uh -uh, don't do that don't do that no I loved you more than that come to me So have you ever invited him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Right where you're at, you can. 
Oh, and you know right now, you know without a doubt, it's the Lord's dealing with you. As I shared with you, that your heart is probably beating fast. And right now, Satan's on the other side telling you, hold on, hold on, he's just about done. He's just about done. Listen to the Lord. Open up, invite him in to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Brother David, I don't know how to do that. Well, let me tell you, it's real easy. All you have to do is to confess that you're a sinner. Recognize that Jesus died and he rose again and that he's in heaven. And call upon him and say, Lord, I need you to save me. Be my Savior. I need you, Lord. And he says he'll do just that. Now, I'd be honored to lead you in a prayer, but me saying it ain't going to save you. You have to ask him personally to come into your life, come into your heart and save you. And if that's you, why don't you pray with me? Pray in faith, believing and asking him. Just pray, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again and that you're in heaven right now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I messed up and I need you to forgive me. Lord Jesus, save me. Come into my life and save me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Now I want to live the rest of my life serving you. Now, if you said that prayer, I want you just to get up out of your seat and come down here and greet one of these counselors right, right now. Just come on. It's all good. Come on. Just come on. Any others? Just stand up and make haste right now. Make haste. It's good. Make haste. Zacchaeus did. He didn't wait, wait around for somebody to tell him. He made haste. What about it tonight? Anybody else pray and ask the Lord to save them? It's all good. It's all good. What about it? Anybody else? If the Lord's put somebody on your heart right now that you're thinking about that you need to pray for, I want you to make your way to this altar and pray for them. Right now, come on. Come on up and pray for them. Lord's put somebody on your heart. We ought to all be able to think of someone. See, there's a lot of people that need to make haste and come to the Lord. Maybe you've strayed away. Maybe you just hadn't had the walk that you once had. Just kindly drifted away, become a little cold. David said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Maybe that's where you're at tonight and you just want God to just to reach down and just to restore. Listen to me. He says, if we'll confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why don't you just confess? Call upon him. Repent and turn. Is that you? Why don't you come and just say, God, I need you. I need you to come into my life and to restore me one more time, Lord. I want to serve you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, I know you're dealing with a lot of folks tonight. God, I pray that you would just continue to move in this invitation time, Lord, and that you would have your way. Lord, you'd be honored and glorified. And Lord, move on those hearts that are just kind of cold. Lord, move on those hearts that just feel like they're not where they once was. Lord, whatever it is that we're dealing with, I pray, Lord, we'd be obedient. Have your way in Jesus' name. Would you stand? Maybe there's someone that you'd like to just get them by the hand and say, hey, come down here and pray for me. Why not just take them by the hand? Say, come and go with me. I, I want to pray for you.
been on my heart all day. Hey, I called my pastor today, Brother Jeff. He is his pastor too, and he said, he said, I'm just worried about Brother Johnny. Well, I called him today. He's been sick. He didn't even preach Sunday and Sunday night. He said, that's the first time I could ever remember. God's put somebody on your heart. Why don't you come pray for him? Why don't you come pray for him? Lift him up to the Lord. We say a lot of times, well, we just don't see the miracles and the things that God used to do. You want to know why? We don't believe. This man who died. We're a New Testament church, as Brother Jeff says, living in an Old Testament mindset. Why don't you call out to him? Why don't you say, Lord, I need you. I believe you and trust you, and I know that you can do the remarkable. And he can. He's still the same. He's still the same. You don't understand. If we'll just call on him. If we'll just call on just him. Call on the master and he'll come the storm with the sand. Just follow. You got a lost fa family member? Face. Let me see your hands. How many of you got a lost family member that you know that's lost? Hold him up. Why don't you pray for him? Hey, if they're worth raising your hand over, why don't you pray for them? This might be the prayer. This might be the prayer. His name is Jesus, the one who Say my life, and he gave me his sight, and he's coming back one day. Oh, yes, he's coming back sooner than we think. Save your life and he will never let you go. When you're in the valley, this is the second night of the service. And you don't know what to do. I want to tell you that seeing Just all the youth come back a second master. night. You don't know how encouraging that is to us. It ought to be encouraging to each one of us older folks because this is the future of the church. Hey, Satan wants them, and he'll do all he can to get them. We need to do all that we can to make sure they hear the gospel and that they grow up in the admiration of the Lord. Will save your life and me right there for you. His name is Jesus. You know, I was thinking so many times we as adults, we want to put it off and say, it's the preacher's job. It's the evangelist's job. It's the music director's job. It's the deacon's job. It's the elder's job. Whatever the case, we want to put it off on somebody else. I'm going to ask you just to step up and say, it's my job. It's my job. Would you say it's your job to tell somebody about Jesus? Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. I, I'm thankful for what God's doing and continue to do. I'm thankful for Grandpa's place. 
You know, God is putting in some pretty neat stuff on, on our hearts and to possibly to, to look at doing this summer. Out here, we're talking with Brother Sean. And I'm praying that this is just the beginning. And we have another one that accepted the Lord as Savior tonight. Michaela accepted Jesus tonight. Can we give the Lord praise? Yes. <laughs> Amen. What a joy. What a joy. You know, the thing, the thing that, I, that I'm loving is just seeing how God is transforming so many things. All the things that has happened in the last few weeks up here, that happened that the devil wanted to make for bad. Look, look at what God's doing. Look at can can we give him praise? Let's give him praise. Amen. 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 <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, if that doesn't do something to you. Maybe you need to come back down here, and we'll, we'll be glad to pray with you. I can tell you that much. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's been a good night. Amen. It's been a great night. Um, back in the back, um, you know, this is what it's about. This is totally what it's about. It's not about us up singing. It's not... It, it, it's, it's all about the Lord and his saving power. And, and that's what causes everything to work. And uh, we want to continue to visit with y'all. I, I want to tell you, uh, thank y'all for the ones that prepared meals today. Uh, we need a, we need a, a physical uh, trainer now so we can work off what we've ate. Um, and so as we... Uh, you know, they're supposed to feed us again tomorrow. And so we may have to get up and uh, run in the morning. I don't run well anymore. I can watch people run, and I feel pretty exhausted from that. But, um, but thank you all for everything that you, you've been doing. And uh, would you go invite somebody and ask them to come with you tomorrow night? I know tomorrow night's Wednesday night, but maybe, maybe if you called your, your pastor and said, hey, look, let's go back over there tomorrow night. Let's all go. Maybe you've got a friend, the one you raised your hand for, that you can go get and bring them back tomorrow night. But if you can't come here, be sure and go to your church tomorrow night. It's important. It's very important. Uh, back in the back, all right, we have our product table and have our CDs back there, and there's all sorts of jewelry and everything. You say, well, yeah, it looks like a Walmart store. Well, I'm thankful to the Lord that we can carry a Walmart store with us because it helps support our ministry. Um, and, you know, there's as I shared with you, as the song says, we live in a big, big house. And, uh, and we have a lot of people in our big, big house and that God's taking care of. And uh, there's four different families that are involved there. And so... Uh, uh, we ask you to come by there. Also, I, I want to make a, a quick announcement. Uh, coming up in January, I know that's a ways away. We just got through January. Um, we, we would love to carry a bunch of y'all to go with us. We're going on a cruise. We'll be singing on a cruise. We'll be going out of Jacksonville, Florida uh, on Carnival. It's a victory voyage. This will be the second year. Uh, if you have an interest in that, check with us. Uh, the, the rates are really cheap, and they have free food on there. And uh, so, uh, and uh, they have 24-hour pizza, 24-hour pizza and ice cream. So, uh, but uh, we would love for uh, as many could to go with us, uh, and we're going to have a great time. And um, but we have all that information back there as well. Uh, stop by and see us, and uh, seven o'clock tomorrow night. Hey, find on, on Facebook. Uh, Hey, Grandpa's place has a Facebook. Is that right, Brother Sean? Why don't you go on there and like it? The Crusaders has a Facebook page as well. 
like us there. Uh, you can go to our website, thecrusaders-ministries.com. You can find us there as well and go to our picture and click on it and it'll carry you to our Facebook page. So uh, visit with us. Don't hurry off. We, we want to shake your hand, hug your neck. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's give the Lord praise one more time. Amen. Brother Jeff, would you close? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you're a mighty and awesome God. And we're so thankful for the blessings that you've given us, Father. Thank you for the 13 now that have prayed to receive Christ this week, Father. Thank you that two of them have come out of Brother Jeff's family, Father. To God be the glory for that. Your Lord, be with tomorrow, the services tomorrow. Be with everybody as they go to work and go to school. Lead them in the direction of you, Father. That no outside influence just bind the hands of Satan away from all of these people and this community, Father. In your name that we pray, give us safe travel. Amen. Thank you.